some of these are familiar faces that were with us years ago and, 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 and have been back and have taken up membership. Clayton and Louise Hobbs. <laughs> Louise is actually our new president of Women's Ministries. And we're glad to have him with us. God bless you. And he just comes along to take care of him, okay? She tried to show Keith and Sharon Stacy.
Dr. Vidal and Lorraine Regis for him. I know right down here, I believe. Right down here. Loving, a sin-hating congregation who will seek after God, and Lord, that we will 
send forth the rays of light and will take the good news to the communities and will declare that Jesus is Lord in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, Father, we thank you and commit them to you in a very special way. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 His soul should dwell at ease, referring to the one the Lord teaches. And his seed shall inherit the earth. Mom and Dad, underline that statement, will you please? There is a promise to the mother and father who fears the Lord. There is a promise, there is a practical, believable promise to those who fear the Lord. And it is for your children and your grandchildren. The Bible says here that the seed of those who fear the Lord shall inherit the earth. I want you to think on that for a while. That mom and dad, you in a very large way, you as a follower of Christ hold the spiritual the physical, the emotional welfare of your children and even your grandchildren in your hands. I want to this Now some may be here saying, well, Pastor, I got saved late in life. I don't my children and grandchildren. You, you fear God and you serve God with that faithfulness and God will take care of the rest. Amen. How I live not only impacts my children and grandchildren because we're in relationship, but also impacts them because I am in relationship with God. And it's not a light thing. It's not a light thing. It's a huge responsibility. But it comes with an incredible blessing. It comes with an incredible blessing. Then... The 14th verse says, and this is why I asked you the question, the secret of the Lord is with them that fear Him. And He will show them His covenant. I, I was interested in this, I was so interested in this in this uh, 14th verse, the secret of the Lord is with those that fear Him and He will show them His covenant, <laughs> that I, I, I researched it in, in, in a number of versions, a number of, of uh, modern day versions more plain English. The New Century Bible says, the Lord tells His secrets to those who respect Him. He tells them about His agreement. He reveals the covenant. He reveals the relationship. Some people would say, I, I don't know where I stand with God. I, I, I don't... Maybe it's because we're not walking in respect. Of 
When I respect my Father, I live my life with Him as a major motivator, whether His presence or absence. How often have we heard of a young man or a young woman who have disgraced their parents? And, and, and it was the disgrace of their parents that really, that really messed us up. How could you do that to your mom? How could you do that to your dad? And so it is the same in our relationship with God. We, when we respect God, He is the motivator in the choices we make and the decisions we, we, we make. But if we as, as children of God just park God on the side and say, well, I'm going to do what right for me. I'm going to do what pleases me. But, but the Word of God says, oh, I, but I, I, I need to do this. There, there cannot be that kind of, 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 of direction from God will not give His direction to those who are loose with their attitude toward Him. And I, I suspect that that is somewhat the problem in the churches and in the lives of believers today. They are in confusion. They are in, in a quandary of what to do. They are, they are uh, living on the edges. And, and, and the reason is because they probably have not had the respect for God that they should have had. And God says, I reveal my ways and my wisdom to those who fear me and to those who seek my face. The message, which was written by um, Eugene Peterson, says, God friendship is for God worshippers. God friendship is for God worshippers. The, the, the message of, of, of the, the heart of my message as I conclude this series is that God wants us to fear Him and to walk in respect because He wants to have a friendship with us. He wants us to have a friendship with us. I'm going to talk about what friendship is in a moment. <coughs> the Living Bible says, Friendship with God is reserved for those who reverence Him. Let me ask a simple question this morning. Would, would, you, would you have a comfortable friendship with someone who, who doesn't respect you? Would you have a, a, a friendship with someone? You might, you might, look, I really like this person. And they have so many great qualities, but they are so ignorant. <laughs> They're just so ignorant. I, I've been with them, and, and I, I've been embarrassed to be with them. doesn't he? He's a, he's a member of your church. And that person is literally an embarrassment. And I've had to say, well, he's not a member, but he attends. <laughs> <laughs> or as if that gentleman was a godly man that reflected the values of the Word of God, I'd say, he is a great man of God. Because it is, he is an asset to the kingdom. And so, the, the same is true. Peter, not Peterson, but the Living Bible says, Friendship with God is for those who reverence Him. With them alone, He shares the secrets of His promises. And so I asked the question, who do you share your secrets with? The ones who, who, who you have a close, reverent, respectful, trustworthy relationship? Or a better mouth? That holds no allegiance to you. See, the fear of the Lord opens us to God's friendship. And, and, and friendship may be a, a rather casual word that's tossed around today. I know people, but I'm not friends with people. I know about people, but I'm not friends with them. 
and I know some people from a distance, and I know some people from close, and I'm still not friends with them. So the friendship we're talking about here is the is the kind that is is a two-way relationship which implies intimacy. Intimacy. Intimacy is is a, a deep level of relationship. My wife and I have a relationship of intimacy as a husband and a wife. Myself and a male friend of mine may have intimacy in the sense that we can sit down over coffee and really talk about things that we wouldn't talk about with anybody else. Because we have that trust level. And, and, and just stop and think. God wants an intimate relationship with us. He wants to be able to trust us. He wants us to have a heart after Him and we draw so close to Him that when we get close, He can share the insights. That's what we're talking about. That's the whole conclusion of this fear of the Lord. The reverence for God. It's taken me three months to get to this moment. But we've gotten here. It's interesting. There's only two individuals in all of scripture that God called his friend. Two individuals. And not the one who had a cell phone. <laughs> the first one was Abraham. In 2 Chronicles 20 and 7, he's called the friend of God. In James, in chapter 2, and verse 23, he's called the friend of God. But it's interesting to understand something. God didn't just uh, wander around the Middle East in the Mesopotamian Valley at one time and say, you know, I, I'm kind of lonely up here in heaven. I'd sure love to have friendship with one little guy down there. So you, uh, this, this guy looks pretty good. I think I'm going to choose him to be my friend. God didn't do it that way. It's very interesting to note that God called Abraham. Abraham obeyed. And then God put Abraham through the test of his life. The test of his life. And it was only after Abraham passed the test of obedience that God referred to him as his friend with whom he could trust his secrets. Wow. Let's take a picture for five minutes. When Abraham, in Genesis chapter 15, if you just want to drop that chapter 15, you want to follow through on this maybe later on. Abraham was 75 years old and God made a covenant with Abraham. It's called the Abrahamic covenant. In that covenant, God promised Abraham a son. Genesis chapter 15, verse 4. Abraham craved a son. And he had only servants. And he was beginning to think that, that he, because he didn't have a son, he wouldn't have anyone to follow in his footsteps or here to inherit his, his possessions. And God said to him, he's 75 years old, guys. And God said to him, um, you're going to have a son and it's coming by Sarah, your wife. And Abraham could cut the mustard, no problem. But Sarah was past the age of childbearing. So God's got a problem on his hands. On this, he works his mighty power in a certain way. Sure enough, You'll find it in Genesis chapter 21. When Abraham was a hundred years old and Sarah was 90, she had a baby. Now, wouldn't you and I be shocked this morning? <laughs> if Sister so and so that we've been helping along through the door for the last 10, 10 15 years, who celebrated her 90th birthday last year, and, 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 and this morning she's away for a few weeks, and, and when she comes in, we said, Why, you put on a little weight? And she says, Yes, I'm pregnant. <laughs> 
Now, wouldn't that be strange? <laughs> wouldn't we have a story to tell? You see, it wasn't the birth of Isaac, like it wasn't the birth of Jesus that was miraculous. It was the conception. If you can get it in there, she can get it out. <laughs> That's not what I, I see what you're thinking. That's not what I'm thinking. I'm thinking this. If God can strengthen the womb, if God could put the seed of Jesus in Mary the Virgin, Mary can give natural birth. If God can strengthen the womb of, of, of Mary, of, 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 of uh, Sarah, and, and she can produce... Right. She will be able to give birth to her. You're right. So you got creative minds. That was not in my mind back to deal with that. It's not that I'm beyond that, but it wasn't that this particular ride. Anyways, the truth is, at age 90, she gave birth to a son. You can only imagine the joy in the heart of Abraham and Sarah when Isaac came into the world perfectly normal. Perfectly normal. It was the culmination, it was the culmination of their relationship that they had had for years and years and years as a husband and wife. It was the culmination of the desire that was in their hearts to have their own child. It was even more powerful since the fact that Hagar had had, had, had a child by Abraham and that had given Sarah a lot of heartache. And it's giving our world much heartache today. <laughs> So you can only imagine the joy. I mean, you're, 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 you're 99, your wife is 90, you have a baby, there's a good chance you won't have a lot. One is probably what you're going to have. So you can imagine the center of attention that child was. The whole world revolved around it. The whole world revolved around it. Their neighbors hated to see Sarah coming because all she talked about was this baby. Abraham's fellow farmers or land keepers hated to see Abraham come because all they heard from Abraham was Isaac, 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 Isaac. Forget about Isaac. Talk about the weather. Talk about anything. But you see, they were consumed with Isaac. They watched him grow. He went from the infant to the five-year-old. They watched him as he, as he learned to walk at two, and then they watched him as he learned to run, and then they watched him as he chased the cattle, and then they watched him as he began to get interested in the, all the things that boys can interest him when dad's got a big spread. Abraham was wealthy. Abraham was saying to himself, now Lord, just give me a few more years to live until this guy becomes a man, and I'm willing to die. Everything is going along really, really good. One night he went to bed. And God speaks to him. How do you find that that's usually when God speaks to you or impressed in your spirit? It's in the evening or the night or the quiet. Mostly because we're so busy all day and our minds, and this is not a negative, this is a, this is a normal thing, our minds are so occupied with the things of life that it's only after we settle down that God gets with us. And God came to Abraham in the 21st chapter of Genesis. It was a painful night. The 21st chapter of Genesis. I'm sorry, I'm trying to say it. Came to pass after these things that God did test Abraham. The King James Version says test. That's a very bad translation. God doesn't test anybody. That word should be test. And God thought of Abraham. And he said, Behold, here I am. And then God explodes the world of Abraham. God explodes the world of Abraham. It 
second verse. Then God said, take your son. And let me put it in my language. He wrote it in. Your only son. Because God did not recognize Ishmael. The son of Agar. When it comes to covenant, he recognized him as an individual. He recognized him as a, uh, a, a son of Abraham. But not as a covenant son. So he wanted Abraham to understand that he was talking about Isaac. He said, take him your own, and whom you love. Did Abraham need to be reminded of that then? Almost in a way, God was making it as tough as he could for Abraham. Why was that so? Because God wanted Abraham to, to really be abandoned to him. To him, God, not Isaac. And go to the region of Moriah. The region of Mar Mariah, by the way, for you folks that are interested, is, uh, is uh, Mount, Mount Calvary. Mount, Mount, the Mount where, not Calvary, but the Mount where the uh, Mosque of Omar is. It's the Mount where David sacrificed the, the sacrifices, and it's the, it's the Mount where his temple was built. Now that's enough property information to keep you busy for a week. Abraham was told to go to Mount Moriah. Mount Moriah became the mount where the temple was. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. <coughs> that was not a miscommunication. That's what God said. Abraham, do it. Do it. You can only imagine Abraham's world was torn apart. Folks, this is not a story. This is a fact. This is the truth of it. <coughs> Isaac was banned according to theologians. They're, they're just, they're, there's no exact age given, but they compare some things. Probably about the age of 18. He was certainly a young man. And look at the next verse. This is the this is the clincher, folks. This is the clincher. He didn't consult with a spiritual leader. He didn't consult with the latest guru. He didn't consult with the latest social sciences to see really if what he heard was true or if he was misunderstood or should he do this? He didn't. He did, there's, there's no indication he even consulted with, with, with his wife, Sarah. If I had times when I would tell you why he didn't, he wouldn't ignore her. He didn't want to put her through needless pain. Because Hebrews says that he knew that if he went to sacrifice Isaac, God would give him back from him. Paul gives us that in second Hebrews. That's just a little side order. I don't, I don't charge you for it. <laughs> Early the next morning, Abraham got up and saddled his donkey. Look at the word early. You and I would say, God, I know I got to do it. I know you said next morning, but next morning, no hand until 11.59. <laughs> Isn't that true? Absolutely. I'm, 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 I'm pushing it out like this so you can see who Abraham is. So you can see why Abraham was called the friend of God. God never had to explain it to him. He never had to drag him. He never had to threaten him. He said, get up and go. And it was sometime in the night when they told him that. And early the next morning. And he took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set it for the place God had told him about. There's so much here I can't, I, I haven't got time to, to go into it this morning. But look at the fourth verse, will you folks? On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. What does that third day mean? 
I'm sure there's some implications there for Calvary and the resurrection. I'm sure that's there. I'm sure that's there. But in the role, here's what it means. Abraham had three days. Three days. When his heart was broken, his mind was torn. His every emotions were straining for some word from God that maybe he had fulfilled the task or maybe God had changed him. He had all, he had three things to ponder. How many of you are in a situation where you better make a hard decision? Say, hey guys, let's do it and get it over with. Many times. Let's, let's get that decision. Let's, we got our mind up, let's do it and get it over with. Painful as it is, let's get it behind us. And we do it and we get it behind us. Or we don't do it and we start to think. Or we start to talk. We start to rationalize. We start to say, oh, I'm just not through God. I, I, I'm sure I can No, no, I, God wouldn't do that. There's a text over here, so I can find something. No, I guarantee God would tell me. So it'll take two or three days eventually to change your mind. Three days to ponder it. He never believed. He never blinked. Never blinked. He obeyed God. You see his absolute resolve in that he had three days to ponder it and never changed his mind. What's this all about? I submit to you this morning that Abraham's obedience was the proof of his fear and reverence of God. I want to say that again. Abraham's obedience proved his fear and reverence of God. You know the story I have no time to read this morning. How he, he, he bound him. And Isaac, Isaac was compliant. Abraham was 99 years old, and in most cases a good, young, and strong 18-year-old man can take a 99-year-old man, man and dismiss him. Abraham took his son Isaac, 18 years old, definitely a man. He made him a sick, he made him a man. And, and Isaac was compliant. Now you get the, you, now you get the, 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 the death of Christ coming in. I don't have time to get It's not the heart of this message. And, and Isaac said, Dad, I got the wood. I, we have the fire. <coughs> But there's no sacrifice. There's no sacrifice. What do you think that done to Dad's heart? I'm stressing this because I want you to see what we talk about when we talk about reverence and fear of God and, and God reciprocating with friendship. And Isaac and Dad, Dad and, and Abraham made that incredible prophetic statement saying, My son. That's the reason why Abraham was moved from land. He said, my son, God will provide a lamb. And Isaac, Abraham began to tie Isaac's hands. I suspect it would have happened this way with, with Isaac. Abraham said, Isaac, get up on the, um, up on the, up on the altar. Because I don't see Abraham tying Isaac's hands, tying Isaac's feet, and then lifting him up there. I would say that, that, that Isaac, Abraham said, Isaac, you're the sacrifice. And Isaac, being a willing sacrifice like Jesus was, allowed his hands on his feet. Abraham took his rather than a big night. Abraham took the Bible says Abraham took the knife and Abraham and Isaac didn't mutter. This is his only son, guys. And he was about to bring it down into the chest of him, Isaac. And God said, Hold it. Now I know you fear. Now I know you're so bad. He knew it before God did. But he knew it. Abraham didn't know it. If you are here this morning being tested, God knows how it's going to turn out. You don't, but God does. 
And, 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 and it was at that moment and God said, Abraham, stop. And of course, Abraham stopped. And, and Abraham looked and there was a ram. There was a ram. Stunned the ticket. Abraham took that ram and made a sacrifice to the Lord. Substitution. You and I should be on the altar to sacrifice for Jesus a substitute for us. And, Je and, and Abraham named the place Jehovah Jireh, which means God sees and God provides. Jehovah sees and Jehovah provides. Jehovah sees me and you and he provides when we walk in obedience, in reverence and fear of the Lord. God knows our lives. We are under constant surveillance by Almighty God. Not that He might catch us doing something wrong, but that He might guide us and protect us and keep us. It's an incredible moment we realize the the depth of what's being said here. To fear God is to believe God. To believe God is to obey God. When we obey God, we guarantee His friendship. His friendship follows, friendship follows our obedience. Moses was considered a friend of God. But before I leave Abraham, it's an interesting God knew Abraham even before this test. And in 18 and 17, God said, God had, 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 was, was, was going to deal with, with Son of Gomorrah. <coughs> and God said, Should I withhold my thoughts from Abraham? Imagine that kind of friendship with God where God consults with you. Not so much to get your permission, but to inform you. It would be like Israel attacking Iraq or Iran because they are great friends with the USA. They would inform the USA. They wouldn't be getting permission. They say at, 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 at four tomorrow morning at midnight tonight we're dispatching ten F sixteen fighters and we're going to blow up a, a reactor in Iran. And so we, that should happen about six tomorrow morning because of the friendship. God said. Can I withhold that information from my friend Abraham? Wow. Because he walked in obedience. Now, here's the encouraging part. And I know it's a weird kind of encouragement, but if we look at the life of Abraham, he made some, he made some boo-boos. I mean, he messed up going into Egypt. He ended up with Agar. He, ended up with, he made some boo-boos, but God did not cancel his agreement with Abraham. Because Abraham feared the Lord and walked in, in, the, in, in God. Let me quickly go through it. I want to pull this towards an end because I, I'm, I'm pointing out that, that the fear of the Lord leads to friendship. And the fear of the Lord is based upon our obedience to God. It's coming to an altar and repeating a sinner's prayer and saying, that's it, I'm saved and I'm okay now. That is, there's much more to it than that. Yes, you're saved. But well, what kind of saved do you want to be? You've got to follow up that faith by your life. Consecrated and in, in reverence and fear to Almighty God. We need to hear that, church. We need to hear that. We have too much easy believism that's producing some real big problems. When God calls us, He calls us to consecration and, 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 and sanctification and a walk with Him. What's the old song saying? He will not walk with the proud or the scornful. Humble thyself to walk with God. The scornful today want to repeat the Lord's prayer and say, I'm saved and go on being scornful. The proud today wants to say, okay, this church thing sounds good. We're going to repeat the creed, but don't expect me to change my ways. He will not walk with the pride or the scornful. 
humble thyself to walk with God. Why? Because God honors a humble and contrite spirit. It's all interconnected, folks. It's in the book. It's in the book. Moses was considered a friend of God. Exodus chapter 33, very quickly. I'm going to pull this to a close. You know my quick days are quick. 33 and 11. And the Lord spake unto Moses face to face as a man speaks unto his friend. God spoke face to face even though Moses did not see the face of God. Now, was Moses always perfect? Was he perfect? No, he wasn't. He messed up as well. He disobeyed God. He, he hit the rock when he should have spoken to it. He killed a, a, an Egyptian trying to deliver Israel before God was ready to deliver them. Don't go and do something stupid to, uh, to accomplish the will of God. Walk in obedience. Hear what God says. He'll bring it about what needs to be done. It cost Moses 40 years in the wilderness. Preparing for a further 40 years in the wilderness. But here's what the Word of God says of, of, of Abraham. That God spoke to him. In fact... In uh, Psalm 103, Psalm 103, just, just go to it quickly. In Psalm 103 and verse 7, the writer, which is the Psalm of David, the of God's love, he, referring to God, made known his ways unto Moses, his acts unto the children of men. Some people know and see the acts of God, but those who walk close to him know his ways. It means... Those who walk closer know why. Well, how could God allow that to happen? When you walk close to God, He'll tell you why He allowed it to happen. That's the difference. And we have all kinds of specialists in there today making all kinds of stupid and silly explanations as to why crisis after crisis comes. And in a way, you're kind of blaming God. They know God will be on it. And there's a, you know, why you God to that. Those who walk with God. In obedience to God, no way. We know why? Because they know his character. They know his purpose. And I don't have to explain God or anybody. You don't have to explain God to anybody. It's interesting though, in those places, oh, there is no God. And then they start saying, Why did God allow this? Well, if there is no God, how come he allowed it? I need to close. But there is, there is, why, I take these Old Testament characters, and we love them, and we, we, and we kind of fantasize, say, oh man, must have been great. If you had Abraham, after the Isaac matter, it must have been great to be in Moses after the, the, the wilderness and all these trials and nations. When he's on the mountain, God is about to, to be his official uh, 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 funeral director. Get a little of this. It's in John 15. You've got to turn here. I don't want to just read this. I want you to see it. John chapter 15. John chapter 15, verses 14 and 15. Let me put it in context where you're finding it. John chapter 15 is, 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 the, is the, that, that, that last extended time of intimacy that Jesus had with the 12 disciples before he was crucified. Jesus is with his disciples. He knows he's going to die. The disciples know some strange going on. And, and, and this is that last Jesus with the twelve sort of thing. Okay? So that's the context of this conversation that Jesus is having. If you've got a, a Bible that shows the words of Jesus in red, you will notice that uh, all of 14, all of 15, and all of 16 down to verse 16 is Jesus speaking. And then from verse 19... Down to the, the end of the chapter is Jesus speaking, and then Jesus' prayer in the 70. So in that body of communication that Jesus was having with his twelve just before he was crucified. 
This is what he said. Henceforth, I call you not servants, for the servant does not know what his master does. But I have called you, say it out loud, say it. I have called you friends. I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit. You are my disciples, or my friends, if you do whatever I command. If you do whatever I command you, 14 verse, look at it. If you do what I command you, you are my friends. Wow. Wow. I could say so much, but I just can't. Let me just close by this pastor, which will come back. This type of friendship is reserved for those who fear him. For with them, he shares the secret of his covenant. Folk, a long time ago, I did a full series on the covenant, and I am so tempted to go back to it, because there's an incredible freedom in understanding the covenant relationship that we are in with God. There is a responsibility and obligation, but there is also a reward and freedom that comes by understanding the covenant relationship we have with God. Friends enter into a covenant. David and Jonathan entered into a covenant. Jonathan died. And years after, the covenant was still being lived out. David, when he was on his throne and had established all of his realm, one day said, go and seek out anybody from the family of Saul. And they said, there is one son of Jonathan with whom he had the covenant. His name is Mephibosheth. But he lives in Lodabar. He lives in the barren, hidden, dry region of, of, of Judea where nobody wants to live. David said, go and get him. Well, you can imagine what Mephibosheth must have taught that day when the king, when the crowd came or the soldiers came or whatever it was and said, King David calls to you. The Bible indicates that he came in and fell down. And David said, you don't need to fall down. I'm putting it in my language because I need to get through this. He said, I have a covenant with your dad. I have a covenant with Jonathan. And from this day forward, you will live in my house, you will sit at my table, and you will be as one of mine. Woo! That's covenant relationship. That's covenant. That's covenant. Jesus said, if you obey me and walk in my commandments, you are my friends. Psalm said, he reveals his covenant to those who are his friends. Amen. Would you stand, please? There's an old him of the church. Some of you don't know it because you never heard it. Some of you are going to be thrilled in your spirit when you think it because you've got something for 45 years. Friendship with Jesus. Fellowship divine. Oh, what blessed sweet